there's this moment on the documentary where they're actually having a Zoom call with George. Like, it's not a Zoom call, of course. I'm just saying Zoom because everyone yeah. knows what that is. They're doing a video call from LA to London with him, like with sh screen sharing, sharing a shot with the editor. And he's on a call making notes. And this is on two CRTs. <laughs> like, it's mm. on a CRT mm. monitor in 1998. Like, just doing a screen review with uh, with a video call in 98 is like science fiction stuff i i just yeah. i i've man you remember how the internet was in 98 yeah <laughs> it's just, i don't yeah. even know how they did it welcome to the vfx notes podcast today's episode is sponsored by action vfx action vfx is my favorite stock footage provider and i've been using them since the day they opened for business in 2016. Since then, I've trusted them to deliver high quality stock footage for all my game cinematics, short films, trailers, and commercials. They have the best stock footage I've ever used in production. If you're working on a visual effects project and need stock footage or assets, don't miss Action VFX Black Friday sale, which begins Tuesday, November 26. They're offering 30% off on all credit plans and credit packs plus a free Asteroid Asset Pack. They also have new releases every month. So stock up now so you can make your next project truly outstanding. Visit Action VFX to learn more. And now on to the show. Hugo, have you ever <laughs> gone and bought a Kenwood 5.1 DTS surround sound system in the early 2000s which costs like a lot of money just so you could watch the pod race from the phantom menace <laughs> in 5.1 surround sound in your lounge room like have you ever done that but like literally just for one film <laughs> no <laughs> sorry <laughs> having said that when i was still a very young boy there was a, a shop, there was like a, a DVD and TV shop in the place where I was at university, and they had the pod race as the demo that you could go there and sit yep. on the sofa to watch. Yep. Uh, and then you would sit down there, and I went there so many times. <laughs> to watch I that. think that happened to me in Australia as well. I watched a demo of the podcast on a lounge in like a big <laughs> electronic store, and I said, I need to have that capability in my <laughs> lounge room which was in my parents house you know it wasn't my lounge room um and i bought a surround system just so i could watch yeah. that sequence and it is incredible in 5.1 yeah. isn't it it is it's it incredible is. it is i did it, i yeah you're, you're right i did buy a 5.1 surround system one of those creative lab ones for the computer uh, which had a really fancy input with a lot of inputs and outputs. We, we sound so old now. Um, but it wasn't just because of this film. I think it was because of a lot of films that came out at that time. Uh, Speed and, and Matrix and Twister. All those films kind of like kind of like pushed me to do that, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it makes a huge difference. Um, but funny thing is people don't really do that anymore. They don't buy the five part because they're all no. watching the they're all watching the films on an on iP iPad like this. Like they're just watching it like that. I, yeah. <laughs> or they're watching it with sound bars which obviously make your television sound better but not not like what it's mixed for in a theater so yeah anyway sometimes when we're talking about the phantom menace which today by the way welcome to the vfx notes podcast <laughs> we're obviously talking about i equate the phantom menace with that very very large purchase while i was still at university um and just getting that experience that I remembered from the cinema at home. But Hugo, great to see you. Welcome to <laughs> VFX Notes Yourself. Aren't we excited to be talking about The Phantom Menace today? I am. I'm super excited about this. Like, obviously, we're doing uh, Star Wars Episode One because, you know, it's the 25th anniversary. Um, I can't believe it's been so long. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember going to the cinema to see it, and and yeah, I can't I can't wait to talk about this with you uh, because this is a very special film for me, and I think it's a very special film for our community, uh, for the visual effects community for sure. Like this film is is really like the starting of the start of a lot of things. Uh, so you know, I can't wait to talk about it. Yes, and before we jump into it, we always want to say a big thanks to our supporters. 
Uh, that includes our Patreon followers, um, members, um, people who like and subscribe us on YouTube, our advertisers, and anyone else who gets in touch with us. We really enjoy that interaction. And Hugo, we couldn't do it without them, could we? No, we couldn't. And thank you so much for all the kind of support and the kind words we get all the time. And <laughs> yeah, it's 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 great to get so much feedback from the from the community. We have a great community, and and it's it's wonderful. Let's talk about our experience watching this film, Hugo. I imagine you saw it in 1999. But you might not have when it first came out. Um, I certainly did. There was a big old cinema in Wollongong where I grew up and they literally showed a midnight screening of this <laughs> man wouldn't midnight screenings be awesome to come back a bit more for yeah. these big film releases I dressed up as Yoda oh, man. and people <laughs> dressed up as you know Princess Leia and Obi-Wan and Stormtroopers and uh uh, people did dress up as Jar Jar. You could actually do that even at the time. And we watched it at midnight and people screamed, you know, when it came on. People screamed at the right moments. Yeah. I I am going to say this, that the screaming and chattering ruined the film for me. <laughs> because sometimes I couldn't hear the dialogue, you know, and actually... <laughs> It, it's interesting. I've just talked about sound mix. There is something about the original release that the dialogue got a bit of criticism for. Um, yeah. And then perhaps after the film came out, when we when we sort of went off onto the road from the cinema afterwards, I would say people went, oh, it's not really what I thought it would be, but it was awesome. And yeah. that's my memory of seeing it. I then went to bed... And then got up at 9 o'clock and went to a 10 a.m. screening the next day at a different cinema. So you could watch um, it. <laughs> watch it again. And actually loved it the second time a lot more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's my memory of seeing it in 1999. What about you, Hugo? Yeah, well, I was at university in Caldas de Ring in Portugal. And at the time, it was a great year because we had The Matrix as well in that year. Mm. A really crappy cinema. In the this is a really small town which has a huge university. Uh, very typical in Portugal that the universities are away from the big cities. Really crappy cinema. Um, it's still open to this day. <laughs> <laughs> and really bad projection, really bad sound, like... It, there's even the columns inside the cinema, so certain seats are not a good seat to be sitting. It's a terrible cinema. Uh, but I watched it. Um, it was full, packed. People weren't very noisy. Like, I don't know, this is a village. I don't think people are, like, you know, obsessed with Star Wars. I don't think so. Uh, half of the room was, like, people from my university. And I, I remember it really well because I really didn't like the film at all. Like I thought the film was like mm. ridiculously bad. And I thought mm. at the time I thought like, what is this? Like a political film about trade embargoes and like, <laughs> oh my God. Like, of course I love the last fight and I did enjoy that a lot. I thought that was right at the end of the film. It became so good. And, and I really remember that, that music, that that chorus going, really giving you shivers when they came in, you know, when they were fighting um, um, the two of them. But I didn't like the film at all at the time. I think it's because, you know, I was expecting something different. You know, I was so enamored with the original Star Wars. I loved them so much. I knew them so well. I had like the VHSs and then I bought mm. the DVDs as well. I watched them and watched them and watched them. They were classics. Uh, you know, like I, I, I grew up with them as a kid. And this was just a very different type of film. Um, and it's funny because I feel bad now because I really love the film now. I think the film has really grown on me. And and now as I'm an older person, because I was like, what, 18, 19 at the time, uh, I feel like I now understand what George Lucas was trying to do. I, I really do understand it now. I think now with the yeah. context of all six films, 
I really think I can understand what you was trying to achieve. Um, I don't think I got it at that time. I think we were so obs- most people around me also didn't like it. I think everyone was just obsessed with getting more of the Star Wars from the seventies, you know, and yeah, and that was not the idea that George had in mind at all, you know. I, I mean, put it simply, it's very hard to follow up. Um, on <laughs> yeah. the brilliance of the New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi, yeah. which just to remind people, we had sort of had this five-year period of the excitement of the special editions coming yeah. out. So that was 1997, yeah, which um, I saw in the cinema as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and so the knowing that they were coming out, I think made people watch them again then watch the special editions, then buy, be able to buy the special editions on VHS and whatever else was available at the time. <laughs> yeah. So everyone was very Laser primed. Disc. Yes, everyone was very primed for Star Wars. Plus, yeah. they'd seen all these new visual effects that ILM had done on the special editions. I just feel like there was not just hype for Phantom Menace, but there was hype at the time for Star Wars... And what we were remembering was how good the um, original trilogy was. When Phantom Menace came out, as we're kind of both saying, I felt like there were some incredible sequences, clearly the pod race and the final battle. But in between some of these huge sequences, at the time, it felt like they were just characters standing around talking. And that isn't my memory of the original star wars although it kind of is if you go back to it yeah sometimes yeah. and i think that's what people found a bit boring with phantom menace when they first watched it yeah i think so too i think you're right i think you're right and and it's most, mostly because it's really tricky what george lucas had to do because he has to introduce all these characters and he has to like still be faithful to what happened because it's a prequel so we know the outcome we know what's mm. going to happen at the end and you have to like construct all these new characters. You have to like explain what happened, how the downfall of, the, you know, how Dark Vader was created, and that is an incredibly hard thing to pull off. Um, and I, I think, but 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 I think he did really well. Now now watching the film twenty years later, I started really appreciating this film like about ten years ago or something. Um, when I when I first bought the Blu-ray, like the new Blu-ray that came out at the time like about 10 years ago. I think I really appreciate it, especially like the way that Liam Neeson is amazing in the film and mm. Ian McGregor is amazing in the film as well. And I, I just feel that, that the film is really misunderstood at the time. Um, but I think you're right. It's it's too much exposition. There's too much conversation. There's too much trade embargoes. And, and it just doesn't have enough fighting, I guess. And then there's a lot of fighting on the second one. But the second one is just not very good, you know, in terms of directing. And there's a lot of... A lot of really strange moments on that film, really a bit not well achieved, uh, especially at, I don't think the CG was ready for the second one yet. Um, and I think the third one is actually much better. Um, but I, I just feel that these films are, are, so, are so special. They're special because I know we're still talking about the experience, but we can maybe start segueing. segueing. They are just like the the blueprint of what we know a film to be today. And I, I feel like that is, that, that's why I really want to talk to you about, uh, because I think George Lucas, which is funny, right? Because he revolutionized cinema in the seventies mm. and then he did it again. Like, it's just like, okay, I'm not enough. I, I'm, I'm, I'm still not all that old. I'm going to just do it again. And I, I'm just waiting for him to come back at any moment and just do it again. You know, why not? Yeah, um, sure. But, I mean, he was already 50 when he started this process. And then he, when he was shooting it, he was like 55 or something like that. Um, and then by the time it was over, it was like 60-something years old. Uh, obviously, he's not going to come back. He's retired now. But but it's fascinating how a person that he was when he was 30, he revolutionized cinema forever with miniatures, with, with uh, you know, motion control, with ILM, with the way that they made effects and you know back projections all those technologies puppeteering and completely blew everyone away and the music the whole thing and then now with digital again for the first time with multiple massive 
uh, you know, massive armies with a digital uh, character that is on the film for like 20 minutes or so. Mm. Like the whole thing is just so ahead of its time. It's just so ahead of its time. Like if you look back, it's easy to look at it now and think, oh, well, all films are like this. But they weren't. Nothing was done like this uh, yeah. before. I, you know, you had Jurassic Park with a few shots, but this mm. is like every shot is a VFX shot, you know. And that was just not not done at the time, you know, in no. 99. You know. Obviously, ILM had built up a capability to yeah. to do that. And, by the way still do miniatures and there's yeah. a lot of miniatures in phantom menace and the prequels um but yes i think i think everything george lucas had built up until then up until then was almost basically for the purpose of making the prequels right yeah including visual effects including sound production including editorial and then i think another part of it is owning the pre-production process i mean he wrote them um and then he had a core team of art directors and concept artists and pre-visualization artists now that's a whole nother newish thing that also happened for phantom menace um it didn't invent previews or anything like that but to have a group of artists at skywalker ranch do the previews for phantom menace um was a big deal so yes, it it's kind of like the process is what George Lucas invented to make Phantom Menace happen possible. But even then it was still pretty ambitious, right? You mentioned Jar Jar being this full CG main character. I mean that yeah. that hadn't happened. That had no, not happened. It hasn't. Yeah. And we had like a few characters here and there, but not to this Obviously, it was all a bit of an, not an accident, but like it was an evolution, a necessary evolution. They were planning to not have a full CG character. The plan all along was to have a suit on set, and then the plan was just to replace the head. Uh, But then slowly but surely, they discovered that it's actually easier to just replace the Mm -hmm. whole thing instead of doing the head stitching. Because at the time, tracking software wasn't as advanced as is today. And just like we do today, today we just replace the whole thing. And that's exactly what they did at the time. So they ended up like spending, you know, I think $150,000 on this suit and ended up becoming like a reference suit, but it still mm. was very helpful for that as a reference suit. And also the the main actor, can't forgive me, I forget his name right now. but I'm at best. Exactly. Um, he, he really contributed to the animation team because he actually performed on set and, and did the whole thing. And so a lot of his essence is still on the character for sure. And and this is just one of part of it. Like when you look at that character, yes, groundbreaking. Both the very early mocap development that they did for that for that character, the full CG integration, which is a hit and miss. I know sometimes it looks a bit cheesy, but sometimes it looks really good. It depends on the shot, really. But then also the other side of it, which is to to have a full CG, almost full CG sequence, like the pod race, which is like. 20 minutes or so it's like really long that's unheard of uh, which has a mixer of course of matte painting and also like uh, miniature and cg but for the majority of it is cg Uh, this is just unheard of and i think i really appreciate what george lucas was trying to do he was really trying to push the envelope as much as he could to see what he could achieve and really pave the way for episode two and number three which became full digital and and those are really like the the like the blueprint of what we do today. Like yeah. there's no way around it, you know. Yeah. So. You, when you say fully digital, you mean shot digitally because of yeah, course Phantom digital. Menace was yeah. shot on film. Although yeah. there, I think there was one sequence where they used a a new yeah. Sony camera. Um, yeah, because they had pickups, quite a lot of pickups at the end, at last like a year later, and I think they was or they were already using that camera just to try mm. to see how it went. And this would be the the Sony, the the Cine Alta Cinema camera that that um, yeah that they drawn Michael Mann used on on Collateral as well. It was like the same camera, so a similar camera. I don't think it's the same model, but it's a similar ca- similar camera, you know. 
Hugo, this might be a good time to point out that we're actually doing two episodes on The Phantom Menace. (laughs) So in this first episode, we're really talking about how the film was a game changer. And then in the second episode, we're going to jump into some very, very big visual effects things, which includes Jar Jar, the pod race and the final battles. Um, But I just want to circle back a little bit to the criticism of the film. Yeah. And whether or not you enjoyed this or not. And and that includes Jar Jar. You know, Ahmed Best performance, I have now come to love. But at the time, people definitely thought it was too slapstick or childish or silly. Now, even back then, I remembered that Star Wars is for kids. You know, like yeah. it really is. And in yeah. fact, that performance of Jar Jar was brilliant for children. And yeah. it turns out kids now, like kids who watch Star Wars now, they love Jar Jar. Yeah. yeah. They want to collect Jar Jar things. They quote Jar Jar. I bet kids at the time were doing that too. But yeah. the adults who had seen the original trilogy, they didn't react that well to no. that performance, did they? No. I th- I guess... I guess people forget that we were kids when the first ones came in. Uh, well, I wasn't even born yet, but yeah. but you know what I mean. Like we mm. were kids because it dragged on on VHS yes. and on on Blockbuster for years to come. So it still dragged on even on the eighties. And I think people forget that that we were kids, and then we grew up. And I think that's why people don't like it because then you grow up, and the film didn't really. Can the film didn't grow up, you know? It's not like mm. Harry Potter, where you have nine Harry Potters, and the first ones are really childish, and then the last ones are pretty serious. Harry Potter has like an evolution, and it kind of like the the Harry Potter franchise is really funny because it kind of like continues with the age of the person growing up. Star Wars doesn't really do that. Star mm. Wars Episode One and is really for kids, like, and we're not kids anymore. So I, I think it's more more of, of a problem of us than anyone <laughs> anyone else really because yeah kids love it and and he's a funny character like what what can you say he's a funny character he's like a like a you know Charles Chaplin you know like like Buster Keaton kind of thing going on with like the slapstick and and it's a bit like that uh, the comedy the the physical yeah. comedy that he's introducing to the film you know i i always had a theory that when someone watches this film just once Actually, quite a lot of what Jar Jar says is a bit incomprehensible, you know, (laughs) and because he's speaking in that kind of Gungan style. Um, And so you have to watch it 27,000 times to sometimes (laughs) realize what he's saying. And then when you realize what he's saying, it's actually hilarious. Yeah. So I always found that tricky. Yeah. It's interesting. I for the twentieth anniversary of the film, I did talk to Ahmed Best and to Rob Coleman, who was ILM's animation supervisor yeah. on the films, and it was a really nice reflection on what went well, but what didn't go so well. Um, you know, for Ahmed when the film came out, and also what Rob felt about being the person who made Jar Jar. <laughs> and I think it haunted him for a couple of years, you know. But as they reflected on the way people now think about the film, I think they've realized that they did something very special, especially yeah. in terms of the whole digital character being one of the first main digital characters, but also how much people like it. And Ahmed's yeah. come back and been in some Star Wars shows and other things. And, you know, I think that's been really great. But... Yeah, sometimes it does take 20 years for people to go, oh, this was brilliant, actually. Yeah. Well, the fil- Well, isn't it the case that the film is really ahead of its time? I think, I think that's really the case. That's really the problem here. And like everything ahead of its time, it becomes a problem. It's the same kind of deal that you look back and you look at Blade Runner, which wasn't really well received at the time. It was much more well received years later, mm. especially mm. when it became like a cult film on VHS on on Blockbuster and on the rental side side of things. Sometimes this happens. Sometimes films only get appreciated a few years later. I'm not saying I'm not saying this is Blade mm. Runner Clone One. Let's not pretend this is not like not a master like it's not a masterpiece in terms of cinema. 
but it it is a, a much better film than people remember. And I really, really recommend everyone to go and watch it again. Try to watch it on a clean mm. way. Just watch it without thinking about the weight of Star Wars and just as a, as a separate film, as one film only, without really expecting much out of it. And, and it's really engaging. It's a really engaging film. Um, you know, maybe people think it's too long. I don't think it's too long. I actually... I really appreciate the deleted scenes. Like when you look at the deleted scenes that are on the Blu-ray, I really love them. Uh, and I really feel the pod race was much, much bigger. Um, but it became much shorter, of course, because otherwise the film would be just a pod racer. But of course, that that has to do with my... That I share with George Lucas. I'm also obsessed with Formula One and also obsessed with um, with um, with driving and in in cars uh, like George Lucas is. And that's why George Lucas is on most time. You see him walking around on the Formula One tracks, like he's walking around and visiting and watching the the races. And that's what that is. That's a racing film, really, mm. that he made there. Mm. Um, and he is, he says that on the Blu-rays and everything. So it was a much larger film because that was. As he says, what did he say? Like he says, I always wish to do a racing film. I never really understood that. Why he didn't do one? <laughs> he could have just done one. He is George Lucas. He could have done whatever well, he wanted. Well, American but... Graffiti is a street racing yeah. sort of, not really. Yeah. And of course, right. there's so many chase scenes in his films. Yeah. But I, yes, yeah. he should really do an F1 racing film. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's about seven being made right now. <laughs> oh, and none of them were George Lucas. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 man, I feel for them. You know, I really feel for them, and especially for the animation team at ILM because they were really not well treated at the time. And I feel like the film, the film was not really well received. And I think it was also not sad. I don't want to use the word sad, but I'm sure they were very disappointed they didn't win the Oscar. Um, and fortunately, The Matrix kind of swoop everything out. Mm. Um, which a much smaller budget, a much more simple film, a much more few, much fewer VFX shots. But it sometimes it doesn't matter. Quantity is really not the thing here. The Matrix was just like even more revolutionary than Episode One at the time. When when you really think about it and look back at it, at least more flashy, I guess that was probably what it was. But it is unfortunate they didn't win the Oscar because if anything, that film should have won the Oscar because that is the blueprint of what we do in vfx today um so it's by far a much bigger revolution for vfx than the matrix ever was uh you know if you look back at everything that was achieved on this film you know yeah i mean you cannot go past bullet time as we've previously talked about as yeah. some sort of game changer and yeah. the virtual cinematography side of that as well yeah um there's plenty of game changes in phantom menace and the prequels but yeah, at the at the time, Matrix was getting the spotlight for its visual effects innovation. Yeah, right. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and it was it was just unfortunate, and I guess it didn't really help the fact that the team probably felt pretty bad because they were getting all this hate from the press and hate from some of the fans, and then they didn't win the Oscar, and I'm sure they were quite down about it. But hey. It still made a billion dollars. I'm sure they don't care. <laughs> like it still it doesn't really matter. Um. Mm. <laughs> just, just, just to talk about one other thing in terms of the reaction to the film, and and I've said now that I loved it. I definitely remember at the time thinking, oh, oh, it could be better. It could be yeah, better. Yeah, and course. I rewatched it earlier this year because I had wrote a few extra 25th anniversary pieces. And it is true, there is this really big lull in action after the pod race when they go to Coruscant and before they come back to um, feed uh, to the planet. And they're on Coruscant and yes, there's some Senate sequences, but gosh, gosh, that is a really big lull in terms of Star Wars stuff. And yeah. look, once you've got it on streaming and once it's on Blu-ray, you can skip that stuff. <laughs> but, like, I honestly felt it needed a big action sequence in Coruscant. And, of course, it has it in the next two films. But that that is another memory I have of re-watching the film this year where I'm like, oh, 
as you sort of said before, Hugo, there's a lot of exposition and he's trying to explain the Senate and Palpatine's place in it and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but it it really needed something in that yeah. middle middle yeah. bit of the film, basically. Yeah, I know what you mean. Especially when we see this, this last fight sequence and we kind of like, man, why, why isn't the film more with that? Like, yeah. Why doesn't the film have, have more of that? Well, I know why, because that's a que- quite hard thing to do. <laughs> you yeah. can't just spend the whole film doing that. Um, uh, otherwise, it becomes like, a, like, a, like a, too much action in a row. It becomes like a Michael, Ma- like a, a Michael Bay film. <laughs> just yes. action, 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 action. But almost um, if you're plotting it out on one of those graphs that shows <laughs> you know, where things are. It's just going up and up or... and up and up, yeah. Well, it was um, just so flatlining over the yeah, middle. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, no, I, I get it. Like, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I really wanted to, to talk to you about um, another thing that I think that this film sometimes I think people forget is that the um, besides the film itself and besides the story and besides the um, the whole thing behind the scenes, this film really started like a really big revolution at the time. Uh, it kind of really started with. Of course, this film, like you already mentioned, was done in film. It wasn't done in digital, but George really wanted to do it in digital. Uh, he really wanted, but the cameras weren't ready in time, so he ended up doing it in film. Um, at the time, Texas Instruments and Sony were, together with George, developing this camera that would be supposedly the Cine Alta, the F900, that at some point that, that was used then on episode two. But not only that side of things, but... George was really about to revolutionize the way we watch movies because this is the first time I remember when I was in Portugal that we started having digital cinemas, um, mm. mostly mm. because of this film, mostly because the film it was already starting to pave the way for episode two and episode three for, for episode two to be completely digital release instead of being a film release. And this really changed most of the industry today. We don't, we can't even find the film projector anymore. We just find digital projections now. Mm. Um, and it all started with episode one, um, when the shift came. Because there, there was, of course, the film version, but there was a DCP in digital, which was uh, something unheard of at the time. This is like 99. Um, so it's, it's, those things are really, they, they, they really change the way um, VFX films happen at the time. Not just this, the digital distribu- the distribution of films, which he was trying to revolutionize, the way they were shot, and they were the way they were edited as well. Um, you know, especially the very peculiar thing that we do these days, which is to basically every shot is a VFX shot, which didn't really happen until this film, uh, where. George was like fiddling around with like different takes, merging them and picking one take from another take and another plate and then merging and stitching them together. This is the most common thing in the world these days and you can even do it on an iPhone, but this was not common in 99. Um, And those things are, for me, they're fascinating. Like they're just Mm. fascinating that it all started with this film, kind of like, you know, like at least on a large scale, that's what I mean, like on a really large scale. I think, yes, I, I'm pretty 100% sure that many editors were doing this in arranging yeah, tools before this. Yeah. Commercials, commercials TV and shows, small films, small sequences. Doing it yeah. on the Avid, doing it in After Effects, doing it probably even in Premiere. Yeah. And, yeah. But, but it's awesome to see on the documentaries for this film the director suggesting these changes to yeah. someone like... Ben Burt, he's editor. Um, there was another editor on the film too, which is Paul Martin Smith. But that has always been a fun thing for me to watch on the documentaries, um, Hugo, because it felt very real time. Now, I don't <laughs> think Ben could do those things in real time in the Avid, but, you know, George sitting over his shoulder saying, oh, let's take um, Anakin's performance here from this table kitchen table yeah, dinner scene and put, the one, yeah. and put it on the other one and you know they were using some morphing techniques to do it and morph cuts and basically rotoscoping heads out and occasionally i do think in the film you can kind of tell there's a few times yeah, where it's yeah, yeah. not super solid 
Yeah, but, sometimes it's just a wipe. Sometimes it's just like a cut in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. under, on, and you can kind of like see a little bit of a yeah. stitch and disalignment. Yeah. I know what you mean. But but because the director was driving it and knew what performance yeah. he wanted and what he didn't want, um, there's something about the way Ben Burt could do that was a much more collaborative thing, I think. And as you say, yeah. they do it all the time. You know, they do it all the, all the, all the time. Well, it's the most mm. common thing in the world now. And, yeah. and that's why it really stuck with me because now every film, every shot is a VFX shot. Like, okay, we the film has 2,000 shots. Imagine if the film has 2,000 shots. 2,000 in, in one will have VFX because the end credits will have VFX. So it's like it, in, in back then, I don't know how many shots this film has, but as I've heard from the several sources, there's only one shot on the film that has nothing, uh, no VFX. So, it, so it's, which is the 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 one where you see the the vapor coming out of the vent for them to be poisoned, when they are still waiting for the negotiation uh, at the beginning of the film. Mm. As I've heard from the commentary audio, like that's the only single shot that is on camera with untouched, nothing was touched on that film, on that shot, which is hilarious to think about. That's that's unheard of at yeah. the time. Uh, yeah, and you could see the ILM faces of the VFX supervisor and all of them kind of like their face started becoming white as soon as he was like telling everyone how many shots we would have on the on the film and isn't, you know like with these little crossers i know isn't that <laughs> one of the coolest bits of that long documentary i think it's called the beginning yeah on, it's one on hour long yeah. on the yeah, dvd yeah. and john knoll was the overall <laughs> production just, the effect suit it's becoming white like <laughs> yeah, and but George Lucas with like different color highlighters showing three thousand storyboards. Like there's literally three thousand drawings, I think, um, that the art team had done. And yeah, but that's that's another thing about the director understanding the process yeah. and knowing, yeah. Yeah. oh, this is going to be a background. Yeah. This needs to be a CG character. I guess you'll do this as a miniature. I yeah. guess you know, and you'll work you'll work it out. And I always thought that's kind of one of the coolest things about ILM as well, yeah. in not just Phantom Menace, but other projects, where they probably said yes to something and they didn't really know how to do <laughs> okay. it yet, you know, and they worked it out. So. Well, there's several times John Law says like things like, we don't really have a way to do that yet, but mm. we're looking into it. <laughs> Like, yeah, it's just like yeah, that is simp- simply not hap- doesn't happen anymore. Like, because now we always know how to do everything. Yeah, these people were still doing groundbreaking, and and going back to the editor, it's really amazing what you see on the documentary because there's a realization. There's a part where the where when George leaves and the editor is there alone with the with the crew filming the documentary, and he's like really like a bit like having like one of those Eureka moments. He's like wow, means we can change anything when we can like really change anything. And he was just really mm. getting to the resola- resola- sorry, realization that, Jesus, we can now do anything we want. There's no limits. We Before we would just like throw away the take. Now we don't need to throw away the take. Mm. And that really, mm. it really hits hard on that documentary. That yeah. that documentary is 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 a time capsule because we don't we just don't get documentaries like that anymore. That documentary is raw. It's completely raw. You see first the t- like first reactions of everything of all these people doing reactions and getting really like sometimes really worried and there's even a part of the documentary where they are actually openly talking about the budget. They're like with a paper and they're like, yeah, that shot is 16 K and this one is 15 K. And yeah, the Mm. matte painting is 25. And how much is that George? Yeah. 1.2 million. So they're like, I've never seen that ever, no, ever. And you never will again. <laughs> Actually, shout out to Lucasfilm who had put that documentary on the Star Wars YouTube um, yeah. website, which is yeah. huge. Yeah. Not doesn't tend to happen. So No, and that was exclusive to the DVD. I'm really happy that they did that because mm. it was only only if you buy the DVD or the Blu-ray, you could watch it. I don't even think it's on Disney+. Plus, So it's great that it's actually in the wild for public because mm. it's a one-hour documentary. All the all the web documentaries, the little web ones that they released at the time in 98, uh, 
they're all on the DVD. Um, not on the Blu-ray, though, like they're on the old DVD. Those are really beautiful documentaries, really small little documentaries, you know. So there's even like this really beautiful documentary of Stuart uh, Freeborn watching the new latex version uh, of, nice. of Yoda. And he's like visiting the studio and just looking at what they're doing now with, with animatronics and radio controlled and it's it's just like this 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 blu-ray with the extras it's like really like a cinema class almost mm. um, it's probably one of the best uh, special editions i've seen in a long long time mm. but, but for everyone well, curious like i would recommend buying both because the this one of course the 4k version great for the for the actual film and for the extras but this one the old dvd has a lot more extras and I bought it for two pounds on eBay, so mm. it's not expensive. So it's worth just to watch the extras, you know. Yeah. So you you mentioned those web documentaries, and they really yeah. took off for Attack of the Clones and Revenge yeah. of the Sith. Yeah. But I remember, you know, this is this is like everybody who's not as old as us. This is like 1998, <laughs> 99 when this film was getting made, and not you know we had. 56k or 33k dial up internet back then and like my other big memory of phantom menace was when apple quicktime released the trailer and the teaser trailer and for me to download that with my internet connection i had to leave that on all night (laughs) you know because it wasn't that fun watching the real player streaming (laughs) version it was no. much better to watch the QuickTime version. And I remember like staying up all night and checking in on how it was going, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. and then watching it. I remember but, yes, those things as well. Yeah. Those those early little fun docos were quite cool. And we always wish that they did more of those with films but these the, days. But there's, you see, you see the amount of things we already mentioned that are groundbreaking from the actual production, but also the distribution, the initial distribution, mm. even the Blu-ray, even the DVD. The mm. extras, the behind the scenes, the openness, like the way George Lucas opens his house to this film, you know, like you yeah. you see everything. And to a point that there's so many groundbreaking things, there's this moment on the documentary where they're actually having a Zoom call with George. Like, it's not a Zoom call, of course. I'm just saying Zoom because everyone yeah. knows what that is. They're doing a video call from LA to London with him, like with sh- screen sharing, sharing a shot with the editor and he's on a call making notes and this is on two CRTs, <laughs> like it's mm. on a CRT mm. monitor in 1998, like just doing a screen review with uh, with a video call in 98 is like science fiction stuff. I, I just, yeah. I, I've, Man, you remember how the internet was in 98. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I don't yeah. even know how they did it. <laughs> I, I have no idea, but actually, weirdly, ILM had been, or Lucasfilm, I guess, had been revolutionizing that in terms of review for a long time, even since Jurassic, when they needed to get Tippett Studio on the other side of the bay to talk to ILM, <laughs> probably then in San Rafael. And they had, you know, some kind of microwave microwave link to do it. But then they also needed um, Steven Spielberg to review shots while he was filming Schindler's <laughs> List, probably in Krakow. And so they had ways of doing it then, you know. So I'm sure they they definitely paid for the bandwidth and made it happen. But yes, I remember that on the doco that was cool too. You're right, Hugo. Yeah. The, the process is one that we're so familiar with now and and having a digital workflow is one we're so familiar yeah. with now but yeah. clearly ILM and was we're familiar we're it. familiar because it's it's open we see it because a lot of films we don't know what happened mm. this film has a full record like an archive of everything that happened yeah even things that happen after you know like i don't know if a lot of people know but when the original film came out yoda is a puppet on this DVD, mm. Yoda is a puppet, but then on this Blu-ray, Yoda is digital. Digital. So even after the film came out, there was still pipelines going on and like edits going on, and mm. even that is something that we take 
for granted these days, but it was not very normal or typical these the, the, those times. I'm, I'm trying to, to remember whether yeah, I'm trying to remember whether there was one digital Yoda shot in the film. Maybe there was at the, one at the end of Phantom Menace when we're when we're possibly in Coruscant or poss- or at the funeral, and it's sort of behind Yoda. I, I, we might have to get someone to tell us, and I'm trying to remember if that was actually a digital Yoda. But what you're getting at is that in the new version, they've replaced the puppet Yoda completely yeah. with the digital yeah. Yoda. The new Blu-ray, the Blu-ray from 10 years ago has a digital Yoda now. So mm. the only way to see the original theatrical version is to buy the DVD. That's mm. the only way. Mm. Just the same way as the original films as well from the 70s. I have the original DVDs and they have the original version of the film on the DVD mm. before before the special edition. So there's no HD version of the scan. There's no scan of, of the original films. George Lucas is like that. He never keeps around the old stuff. He's always changing it back. And right. Never, Which a whole uh, nother level of criticism was yeah. um, pegged at him about the special editions and yeah. using too many digital tools to change yeah. something that people loved. But I think I agreed with most of them, especially restoring the film and making yeah. it look look yeah. better and fixing yeah. problems with the actual film yeah. prints. Um, well, the small stuff, I don't really care. Like the explosions look so much better on the new version. There's no yeah. way they're wrong. But there's yeah. other things that are a bit like, ah. I mean, the, that shot with Jabba the Hunt and Harrison Ford floating around around him is just like ridiculously bad. <laughs> It, no, well, no disrespect to the composer that did the shot. I'm sure he did his best at the time. Yeah, they did his best, their best. And there's actually multiple versions of that shot <laughs> after the special editions where they've, you know, did an original CG Jabba the Hut, then did a new version of Jabba that matched the prequels and the new films and new whatever. And it still kind of looks a bit hokey, but I think it's fun. You know, I th- there's a whole discussion about going in and changing and fixing films afterwards, and we could probably do a whole podcast on that, Hugo. Oh yeah, but no, I, know, in, I know. In the world of Star can, Wars, it kind yeah. of works. I know. I think, and they talk they talk about it on the on the Blu-ray as well on the DVDs. There's like these really great featurettes on the DVDs with about editing and about like changing things. There's even like interviews with George Lucas and Coppola and Kaufman and like there's there's quite a lot of stuff on this these Blu-rays which are yeah. really going through those things. Uh, and George Lucas has always like said to everyone that it's it's his it's his films that he we can do whatever he wants and he. I don't think he finds it like he's finished with the film. I, I don't think he... And we are never finished with anything, really. Like I completely relate to his sentiment because when you're delivering something, often is not finished and you wish that you had more time to finish something. Yeah. Obviously, the other the other side of the coin is like, when is it when is it over then because then you'll fix it forever mm. and i guess i guess that could be the criticism that people were at the time and i don't think the technology was advanced enough for it to look as good as he probably thought it would look and and some stuff is a bit cheesy and some stuff are, are a bit like weird but i i just feel like the technology i mean he's he's a he's a he's a maverick you know like the technology is there kind of he just goes for it i i think he's always been like that on all his films and you can kind of see that on on the behind the scenes he doesn't really care he's just a fast he's a fast gunner you know like he's he's just shooting (laughs) and just yeah finds out what happens later (laughs) yeah that's true (laughs) yeah i I, I don't if, think he thinks much about it. Like he just keeps going, you know. Well, it just enables him to do yeah. the story he's thinking about, right? I mean, even if you, we're going to talk about Jar Jar in the next episode again, but there's some shots of Jar Jar where it's a full-on digital character, but he's like off frame. Yeah, he's like not front and center at all. So he's just considered one of the actors. You know that that's that's where George took this. It just enables him. Yeah. To um, plonk plonk his tripod down in the center on and have the camera on sticks and just that's the scene right, and then whatever he puts there, I always felt like George did that for this film in particular. He just composed the scene 
without worrying too much about everything else. Now, does that sometimes create relatively boring frames and yeah, sure. some slow exposition? Yes, it does. Yeah, but it, does. it works for him. Yeah. yeah, it does, and and it's 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 is resili- resilience is Im- impressive. Like I don't know if you, I'm sure you've seen this, but for those of you who haven't seen the DVDs, like the, he went back and finished the deleted scenes, like because he thought no, they are deleted scenes, but I'm gonna I'm gonna fucking finish them, and he did. Like he actually hired VFX artists and he animated the shots and composite the shots, and mm. and the deleted scenes are finished. Not perfect, of course, because it's like deleted scenes and SD resolution for the DVD. So they're like much lower res, but they are all finished. And mm. and man, we have we have something amazing and unheard of on a DVD because of this. But so because of this, because of the finishing of the deleted scenes, there's an actual entire featurette, like a 15 minute long featurette where a flame artist called Dean York is actually disconstructing the shot that he's just done mm. layer by layer on a flame. He's like next to the flame. You can see the interface and he's like going through it, explaining what he did. I've never seen this before on a Blu-ray, like ever. Like and I, and we, and again, like you said, you'll never see it again. Uh, this is like a level of this construction that is unheard of, and it has to do with the way that Lu- George Lucas not only is open, he's always so open, and all these DVDs and all these Blu-rays have like tons and tons of stuff to watch, and they're like master classes of filmmaking. He's not only open to share that information with everyone, uh, really to share it, mm. but he just, I don't think he can take no for an answer. Like he just finishes anything. Like I, it doesn't really matter for him. And you can kind of see feel that when you watch the DVDs. I have a lot of respect for him. Like I think he's, he's a, he's, you know, like a really strong, long, strong character, you know, and, and he really knows what he wants, <laughs> which is great. You know, it is. I just want to go to one thing we didn't really talk about at the beginning, Hugo, which was the actors. I mean, we obviously mentioned Ahmed Best, and um, I just think... I actually do think this film was perfectly cast. Yeah. I just think Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan is just so perfect. I know. I think Natalie Portman as Padme is brilliant. And she actually got criticized for doing a very monotone thing. For maybe for the Queen Amidala stuff. And I think that's unwarranted. I think she was just perfect as that character. I particularly love Liam Neeson. Um, yeah, as he's Kygon. fantastic. I want to see a prequel with him. Yes. <laughs> I see well, the first we got one. to see him a tiny bit, didn't we? Um, but I've always wanted to share this. Maybe I've told you offline sometimes, Hugo. Uh, this is like Ian's fantasy version of the prequels where in in the end of at the end of um attack of the clones um uh, dooku goes somewhere dark in um Coruscant and meets emperor palpatine i always thought i really hoped while i was watching the film that maybe qui-gon jinn was going to emerge with those three, those two as well, and actually have been an evil character oh who who forced, you know, like managed the process of training Anakin so that he would become Darth Vader, and of course Qui Gon died and was burnt, you know, was cremated. So I don't know how that was going to happen, <laughs> but I was always like, oh, wouldn't that have been the most amazing Empire Strikes Back twist? Um, yeah. In the second film. Of course, it didn't happen. But I think I've always wanted to share that Ian's crazy film fan theory about... Hey, you can write... You know, there's always been... Since the very beginning, there's always been fan fiction for Star Wars. Mm. Go for it. Mm. (laughs) On an alternative universe, you can pitch this to Disney Plus and do a TV show just about that. (laughs) You know? Like, I I, I think Liam Neeson is a perfect choice and yeah this is just at the cusp of all three of them they're just at the cusp of becoming incredibly famous like i i i feel like natalie portman was a bit famous but not too uh, not not like she is now you know Mm. ian mcgregor definitely was not as famous as he is now like he was he was you know of course hot out of transport train spotting and 
he was like you know relatively famous in the uk but not really mm. in the united states and liam neeson was smee famous of course he did a few films by by then but i think he was the most famous of all three but it's it's a really testament to george lucas to like bet on these three actors because he kind of probably saw something on them and they became super successful after this film yeah and you know like i i feel like i feel like it's a a really good cast the same thing happens with the second and the third one i think you know samuel jackson is my favorite character on the second film and and i i, lo- I wish i could see more of him on the film yeah <laughs> you know because i think he's such a cool character yeah um yeah even the uh, you know the guy that like the actor that plays the the emperor as well ian um what's his name mcdermott uh, yeah, yeah. McDermott. he's great as well he's he's so great, great. Yeah. yeah, he's such a nice and, guy. <laughs> yeah, and Jake Lloyd as Anakin is also perfect. Probably suffered from being in such a huge production early on in his age, you know, but was was just right, I think, as Anakin. And this isn't there great, um, uh, you know, footage, uh, like chemistry footage between him yeah. and Natalie Portman, the Are You an Angel uh, yeah, sequence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On yeah. the Blu-ray, that is really cool to see. There might even be the other actors that tried out for Anakin. Yeah, the, on, on the there. DVD you can see three the three finalists mm. uh, uh, out of the three thousand. There was three thousand, and then it came out down to yeah. three. And you even see, that's what I was saying. It's unheard of watching a DVD like this. There is even a part of the DVD where George Lucas is actively saying that he doesn't take he doesn't think that Jack would be a good choice because he's too. And even and he's he, he 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 fucks up his lines too much, but he's the most surprising of all the three kids, so he mm. prefers that one. Mm. And he gets a bit. You can see it on the Blu-ray. Sometimes he gets a bit frustrated with Jake, and he's like, Jake is takes a long time to get the takes done, and he's a really small kid, you know. Like he's so so. Those things are you don't see those things anymore. But it, it's it's really a, a a a great piece of behind the scenes to watch. Um, but yeah, you're right. The actors are great, and then of course also you have the the voice actors. You know, I, I love the Watto uh, uh, voice. You know, mm. like the guy that they. Oh my god, he's so good. He's so good. He's very good. Ah, oh, he's so good. Those tricks don't work for me. It's just so fantastic the way he talks. <laughs> he's so funny. You know, I I, I feel like the mm. the film is really well cast for sure. You know. Yeah. One other thing before we wrap up, maybe Hugo is I really want to spruik this book. That John Knoll wrote, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is called Star Wars 365 Days. Now, it's actually on all the films um, yeah. until... It's funny. I have that book, but it has a completely different cover. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. My anyway, cover this, is blue. That's I just This is one of my just favorite books because it's really simple in terms of having stills that maybe John took or yeah. stills from the film and befores and afters. And then just John explaining why they shot something the way they shot it. You know, like, um, gosh, anything, a miniature or, you know, he, there's lots and lots of HDRI photos or panoramas. Yeah. I'm going to show it up like that. But yeah. I just I just love this book. And if you haven't read this or got your hand on it, hands on it, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic book for sure. Yeah. It's a fantastic book. Um Give me just one second, because I'm I'm really like curious about this now. Is it really a different book? Maybe it is. Oh yeah, yeah. See, yeah. Isn't this the same book? Because it also it has the same exact name. Yeah, it's the same book, but maybe they just really wanted to what tap happened? into the original trilogy. Yeah, it's the same exact How funny. book. Wow. I know. So, and and yours has a CD. Mine doesn't have a CD. Because I saw it on the cover there. It says DVD. Mine doesn't have anything. Yeah, your so you heard yours has a DVD. Yeah, your yeah. cover is this thing, isn't it? It's this but one. But who does yours say it's, it's by? Well, by, my says John Knoll, creating the worlds of Star Wars. John Knoll is but from. Of course, Ab- inside Jonathan Rizler, Rinsler also wrote for it. It seems he's on. You know, so. Jonathan Rizler is on the, the DVD. He, one of the featurettes yeah. is with him. Are we including this in the podcast? You <laughs> yeah, we are. Of course, this is fascinating <laughs> stuff. I'll cut it around and I'll make it shorter, but I I find this I find that fascinating. So I'm really this... now having FOMO because I don't have that DVD. <laughs> oh, oh the the side. Oh, do I look, even the... have? 
Oh, here it is. Look, the side is the look. The side is the the same. Wow, yeah, can I even see. run this DVD anymore? Look, it doesn't have a DVD in mine. See, it's empty. It doesn't have a DVD. And and the 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 side book is the same as yours. It's only the front. Now I really have FOMO, man. I want the DVD. <laughs> okay. <Shit. laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Love it. Well, well everyone. Anyway, I, don't, I don't know how you want to cut that, but that I fo- I found that was kind of funny. You, that cut that. You could include the whole thing if you want. I think that's funny. <laughs> well, Hugo, that's our first take at Phantom Menace. And we're obviously going to back this up with the second episode, which goes very specifically into the big visual effects sequences, um, specifically Jar Jar, the pod race, and the final battles. Um, we've got lots to say. Uh, there's some great coverage on befores and afters already, so you'll, you'll hear about that as well. Um, but yeah, uh, really interesting to talk to you about this and think about it 25 years later, Hugo. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. How old are we? <laughs> We're so old now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. No, I thought it was great. Thanks, man. <laughs> okay. See ya. Bye. See you later. Bye.